Alright everybody, so today we're going to be taking a look at uh, Guillaume Fay, or Guillaume Fay. Um, we're going to be taking a look at his work, uh, Archaeofuturism, which is a, uh, it's a book that he's, he's pretty much well known for. Uh, Fay was a sort of, I mean, I don't want to necessarily say well known, but he was kind of a well known figure in the dissident right. He uh, unfortunately passed away in 2016. But he's, he's well known for his book, uh, Archaeofuturism, European Visions of the Post-Catastrophic Age, which basically this this book looks into or goes into um, the what we're the expecting civilization to come for Europe and actually in a way civilization overall in relation to Europe, though. So that that's kind of the premise of this book. The book is um, it's an interesting book. So we're, we're going to be going over some of the sections that I think are very important. Uh, I'm not going to be going over the whole book because uh, I will be here all day. But um, but yeah, I mean, we're just going to go over a couple sections here and you should definitely read the book yourself. And hopefully this video will give you kind of a good idea of what he's all about. So, you know, Faye, uh, we're going to start out with it, the beginning of this book, the central part of this book, which is um, a critique of modernity. Now, we see this a lot with traditionalist thinkers, which... Uh, Fay isn't necessarily, he's a synthesis of um, modernism and uh, traditionalism. Modern, modernism in a certain kind of sense, not in the sense that most mean it. So he states that uh, in order to do away you know, with present conditions uh, which in which we reside, we must create a new means of radical thought, as radical thought is the only form of thought which can change the system itself as that which is radical is only so in uh, in a relative sense to what uh, is the status quo or what is the current power structure. Fay is also uh, a critique of the modern outlook on infinite progress and also its opposite which is just as much of a modern outlook which is utopianism which is this sort of Hegelian end to history. Um, he takes issue with the assumption that you know the European system and by extension, the American system as well uh, is applicable to all peoples, uh, as well as the assumption that "quote unquote" progress has made people happier overall. That being said, modernity, in a way, uh, in the way it is manifested now with a global capitalist system, is going to lead us toward the path of collapse uh, and catastrophe for the first time on a global scale because because capitalism is a global economic system at least in the state at least in the state that it's in now um, when that collapses well there's going to be a domino effect it's going to affect the world globally uh, Faye states that uh, within the current structure present in Europe the trends apparent will lead to the demise of uh, the Europe as we know it today so we're going to quote him a lot throughout this analysis you'll see that the majority of this is just going to be me reading what he has to say because I think, he, you know, what he's saying is pretty straightforward. I don't need to put it in my own words because he's pretty clear about what he what he thinks. So, quote, The first is the widespread metastasis of the European social fabric. The demographic colonization of the northern hemisphere by peoples from the south is becoming an increasing problem, despite all the reassuring statements on the part of the media and one fraught with explosive consequences, associated in particular with the collapse of the churches in Europe, which has become a land of conquest for Islam, the failure of multiracial society, which is increasingly racist and neo-tribal, the progressive ethno-anthropological metamorphosis of Europe, a veritable historical disaster, the return of poverty in both East and West, and the slow but steady increase in crime and drug consumption, the ongoing disintegration of family structures, the decline of the educational system, and the quality of school curricula, the disruption of the passing down of cultural knowledge and social discipline. So this is what the diminishing European world is going to look like, which, I mean, in a sense, we kind of see now, and it's at a much lower degree, but this will just be increased and eventually lead to a, a collapse over time. He states also, quote, Pensioners of the grandpa boom Europe will collapse under the weight of the elderly. 
Countries with an aging population will witness the slowing down and crippling of their economies, for increasing resources will have been used to pay for health care and the pensions of unproductive citizens, besides aging, uh, aging limits, techno-economical uh, dynamism. So aging is a limitation upon um, the techno, uh, technological, for lack of a better term, just innovation. Um, Continuing on, he says, the egalitarian ideology of old modernity has prevented any serious engagement with these problems, as it is paralyzed by two dogmas, antinatalism, a form of ethnomasochism, which censures all attempts to voluntarily increase birth rates, and the egalitarian refusal to pass from a social security system based on redistribution to capitalization, pension funds, in other words. The worst is yet to come. Unemployment and poverty will increase while a small class working in the international marketplace and supported by a class of bureaucrats and office workers will, will, uh, with secure positions will live comfortably. Economic horror awaits us. By a pervasive process, egalitarianism is engendering a society of socio-economic oppression, thus showing itself to be the opposite of justice, as understood in Platonist terms. Even the socio-democratic welfare state founded on the myth of progress will collapse. And with a greater crash than the communist system, Europe is turning into a third world country. Before us is a time of crisis or, just continue on here, rather the crumbling of the foundations of this socio-economic structure that has taken the name of civilization. So, just to kind of sum that up for you, he's saying that, yeah, uh, because of the influx of all these non-Europeans into Europe, the inability of the European system to maintain this, you know, this new social setting it's created for itself, this is going to lead to a collapse. It's going to lead to neo tribalism between ethnic groups. Uh, this is not going to look good for the aging population, which I get, I mean, I think this was written in the early 2000s. Um, so it's kind of, um, you know, he's got a lot of things right so far. So continuing on, now we're going to get into the actual meat of this uh, archaeofuturism. So you know, now we move on to his definition of this, uh, which is arche the archaeofuturist world is the world that comes to greet us post-collapse. So Faye wishes to overcome the dialectic between modernity and the world of tradition. Uh, in other words, remove the old and socially crippling baggage of traditional ways of living and thought, which is a, which is an issue that many traditionalists don't. Um, account for, and at the same time removing the diseased idiosyncrasies of uh, modern thought, all whilst maintaining the good aspects of both of these things. So he states, I'm going to quote him again here, uh, is archaism a form of traditionalism? Yes and no. Traditionalism entails the transmission of values and is rightly opposed to those doctrines that wish to make a clean sweep of things. It all depends on what traditions are handed down. Universalist and egalitarian traditions are not acceptable nor are those that are diseased, demobilizing, and fit only for museums. Should we not draw a distinction when it comes to our traditions, or values transmitted, between positive and harmful ones? Our current of thought has always been torn and weakened by an artificial distinction contrasting traditionalists with those who look towards the future. Archaeofuturism can reconcile these two families through a dialectic of overcoming. Now, I also want to add here, this reminds me of going on. When he says that traditionalism is not about following past ways of thinking, or it's not about following the past for the sake of the past. It's about following true, eternal, and primordial principles. The only reason it's ever called a it's ever called traditionalism to begin with is because these things have been manifested through a tradition, but the tradition itself doesn't define or make these things valuable in and of itself. They are valuable in and of itself because they are the true and the good and the, you know, the eternal truth that precedes being, well, precedes the being in which we have it. Now, in this case, this is more of a political, tra like he's thinking more in the sense of political traditions, I'm assuming. But uh, it, it does tie in since your politics are downstream for you, from your ethics, which is going to involve metaphysics if you're consistent with yourself. So continuing on, he says, The challenges that shake the world and threaten the downfall of egalitarian modernity already of an anarchaic sort. The religious challenges of Islam, the geopolitical and thassilocratic battles over a scarce agricultural, fishing and energy resources, the conflict between North and South, and colonizing immigration in the northern hemisphere. By uh, 
the colonization between North and South, he's talking about uh, Europe and, you know, the Middle East, Africa, and, you know, the sort of subterranean, <laughs> for lack of a better term, regions of the world. The pollution of the planet and the physical clash between the ideology of development and reality. All these challenges lead us back to age-old problems, the most theological political discussions of the 19th and 20th centuries, which were like debates concerning the gender of angels, are being cast into oblivion. The return to quote-unquote archaic and hence fundamental questions baffles modern intellectuals who expound on homosexuals' rights to get married and other such inanities. The attraction towards the insignificant and memorializing of the past is a characteristic of dying modernity. Modernity is backward-looking, whereas archaism is futurist. So this inevitable collapse of society will you know, basically force a European to have to actively engage in these kind of, kinds of questions uh, and consider um, what conclusions they're going to have to come to and how they're going to have to deal with this kind of new um, world. So he's, we're going to quote him again here. Um, the European soul is marked by a longing for the future, a sign of youthfulness. This is kind of like the Faustian spirit that Spangler talks about. To put it shortly, it is historical and imaginal. Uh, it constantly envisions future history according to a plan. In art, too, European civilization has been the only one in which forms have undergone constant renovation and all uh, cyclical return of the past models has been banned. The spirit of artworks must remain unchanged, the archaic pole, in other words. But their form must always change, the futurist pole. So the spirit remains the same, but the form in which the spirit is embodied is what is changing, is what he's saying. The European soul is defined by ongoing creation and invention. The poesis of the Greeks, while being always aware of the fact that in its direction and values, it must remain faithful to the tradition of the uh, their traditions. The essence of futurism is the planning of the future, not making a clean sweep of the past. The envisioning of civilization, in this case European civilization, as a work in motion, to paraphrase Wagner's musical expression. Uh, politics here are understood not merely in a narrow sense as the identification of one's enemy, which is a reference to Carl Schmitt, uh, but as the identification of one's friend, who is part of the folk community. And most importantly, continue on here, as a future transformation of the folk driven by ambition, a spirit of independence, creativity, and the will to power. So this is interesting. I really like this idea where he speaks about the, you know, we're not here to get rid of traditions, but we're here to get rid of the dead bodies in which they instantiate themselves. We need to constantly change the uh, bodies which... Um, we are using to express the world of tradition. This is very similar to, you know, the Platonic um, notion of the worlds of being and becoming, and the world of being imposing itself on becoming. Being, in this sense, can be uh, analogized to the notion of tradition, which remains the same, remains primordial, remains eternal. Becoming can be ana uh, analogized to the um, the forms in which the tradition is taking place which is always changing matter is in flux prima materia to you know quote uh, aristotle anyways this dynamic force however and projection towards the future meets many obstacles the first is egalitarian modernity with its morality which lays guilt upon force and its historical fatalism the second obstacle or rather danger is the uh, is in the social field which is represented by a deviated form of futurism which may lead to utopian aberrations for sheer taste of change for the sake of change. Thirdly, when left to itself, particularly in the realm of technological science, the futurist mentality may prove suicidal, especially because of its impact on the environment, given the risk of deifying technology as something that can solve everything. Hence, futurism must be tempered with archaism. Or, to use a bold expression, we might say that archaism must be tempered with uh, Sorry, we might say that um, archaism must cleanse futurism. So in other words, yeah, archaism or traditionalism, primordialism must be that which is guiding the futurist movements within, you know, politics, society, etc. The futurist mindset has also encountered a number of quote-unquote barriers, a limit to space-based enterprises because of their high cost, the trivializing of technological science and its loss of meaning. 
disenchantment towards all positive and creative values of mobilization, widespread loss of poetic and aesthetic qualities through commercialization, etc. The implication of all this is that futurism can only become a driving force if it takes a new course. The neo-archaic world that is looming near is the only one capable of freeing the futurist spirit from the impasses of modernity. So now Faye is going to, you know, basically this idea is that we need to have something guiding our futurism, which is going to be our primordialism. But we, need, we must be careful not to conflate the primordial traditions or the primordial spirit with the forms in which it is instantiated in the sense of, you know, because things change throughout history. We can't hold on to one particular form because that is just a single form that lives and dies, that is negated throughout history. But, the, but what is controlling that remains the same. So continuing on here, he's going to speak more about the synthesis between archaism and futurism. Quote, as a philosophical alliance between the Apollonian and Dionysian, futurism and archaism are both related to Apollonian and Dionysian principles that have always appeared to be mutually opposed, when in fact they are complementary. The futurist pole is Apollonian in its sovereign and rational plan to shape the world, and Dionysian in its aesthetic and romantic mobilization of pure energy. Archaism is uh, telluric, or telluric, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that correctly, uh, in its appeal to timeless forces and conformity to the arche. But it is also Apollonian in a sense, for it is founded on wisdom and the endurance of human order. It is a question for future society of no longer thinking according to the exclusive logic of or, but according to the inclusive logic of and, of simultaneous. Uh, simultaneously embracing ultra science and a return to traditional solutions that date back into the mists of time. So this is interesting. So he kind of overcomes this dialectic by showing that futurism and archaism both have aspects of the Apollonian and Dionysian. Uh, in the case of the futurist, the Apollonian is, is this will to innovation. Uh, it's Dionysian is this, is this constant um, sort of shifting. It's shifting and changing. In the futurist poll, um, you know, I'm sorry, in the Dionysian, uh, poll for the um, archaist is I think similar to I guess in a way like you're more controlled by your vices or something but it's also in, in another sense primordial in the sense that it is controlling your um, it's order it's, it's order it's primordial order in other words so continuing on here, futurism is actually more vigorous than archaism for reasons of sheer realism. A futurist plan can only be implemented by resorting to archaism, hence the paradox of archaeofuturism, which rejects all, all ideas of progress as everything pertaining to the worldview of a people and must rest on unchangeable basis. Although forms and expressions may vary, for over the past 50,000 years Homo sapiens have changed very little, and archaic and pre-modern models of social organization have proven valid. The fallacious idea of progress must be replaced with movement. An astonishing degree of continuity exists between archaic values and the revolutions technological science makes possible. Why? Because the egalitarian and humanitarian mindset of modern man, for instance, does not allow him to manage the explosive possibilities behind genetic engineering or the new electromagnetic weapons in the making. The incompatibility incompa between modern egalitarian ideology and futurism emerges in the extraordinary limits placed upon the civil nuclear power industry in the West through the influence of manipulated public opinion or in the pseudo-ethical obstacles raised in opposition to genetic engineering, the creation of quote-unquote modified human beings, and the positive eugenics. The more archaic futurism becomes, the more radical it will be. The more futurist archaism becomes the more radical it will be so basically the um you you like these things are enhancing each other the archaic principle is guiding the futurist principle and the futurist principle is enhancing the archaic principle by giving it more of an opportunity to express itself but without the archaic principle the futurist principle is null because it has nothing to basically allow it to operate but at the same time, without the futurist principle, the archaic principle does not have this ability to fully self-express. So this is sort of like, this is almost in a way Hegel's slave-master dialectic. It's sort of similar in its logic, its, its form. Um, but 
anyways, continuing on, needless to say, archaic futurism is based on the Nietzschean idea of umter or uh, umorton. I'm not. I'm probably not pronouncing that correctly at all, but. Anyway, the radical overthrowing of modern values and a spherical view of history. Egalitarian modernity, founded as it is on faith and progress and boundless development, has adopted a secular vision of linear, ascendant, eschatological, and soteriological, redemptive view of history, which stretches back to time of the religions of salvation, which is also shared by socialist and liberal democratic thought. Traditional societies, particularly non-European ones, have developed a cyclical, repetitive, and hence fatalistic view of history. The Nietzschean view of history, history which Loki, which I think that's how you say this person's name, described as spherical, differs from both the linear and the cyclical notions of progress. So what is this view? Let us imagine a sphere of a billiard ball moving in disorderly fashion across a surface or moved by the necessarily imperfect will of a player. After a number of spins, the same point on the surface ball will inevitably touch the cloth. This is the eternal return of the identical, but not for, not of the same uh, return, against, again in a different form. For the sphere is moving, and even if that very same point is touching the cloth, its position is not the same as before. This represents the return of comparable situation but in a different place. This can also be understood uh, in Leibniz's idea, this is, this is me speaking here, of uh, the law of indiscernibles. Like yes, no two ontologies are the same because if they are two ontologies, the very identity of them being two is a, is a different differentiation between them, therefore they are not the same. If they were the same, they'd be one unitary ontology. It's the same principle here. The same image can be applied to the succession of the seasons and the historical outlook of archaic futurism. The return to archaic values should not be understood as cyclical as a cyclical return to the past, as a past as the past has failed and has engendered the catastrophe of the of modernity, but rather as the reemergence of archaic social configurations in a new context. See this is what I was saying before. It's the it's the eternal being manifested in the contingent. Um which is an ongoing process, being imposing itself on becoming, if we want to use platonic, uh, the approach is platonically. In other terms, this means applying age-old solutions to completely new problems. It means the reappearance of a forgotten and transfigured order in a different historical context. So following on from this, he's going to talk, he's going to talk about the confrontation between the northern part of the world and the southern part of the world. Uh, he states, this global return to the archaic that began in the 1980s has radically altered modern geopolitics. Islam uh, has once embarked on its march to, of conquest, which European colonization had interrupted. A few centuries ago, colonizing migrations are pouring into the northern hemisphere, like a backlash against colonization and the demographic aging of the north in the 19th and 20th century opposition between Europe and North America, and within the Eurasian continent between quote-unquote Westerners, which did not always include Germans, and Slavs, is coming to an end. Today's contrast, tomorrow's confrontation, is between North and South. So this he's talking about, yeah, there's no longer really that much need for inter, you know, inter-conflict between Europeans. It's going to be between North and South. We are already facing archaeofuturist challenges, yielding to the naive myth of interracial integration or ethno-pluralist communitarianism is an aberration. The mindset of Muslims and immigrants from the South, as well as that of the sons of the immigrants who, in expanding and increasingly aggressive masses, are in, and inhabiting European cities, as well as that of uh, the leaders of the emerging Muslim and Far Eastern powers, while masked by a hypocritical Western and modern gloss, has remained archaic. It is based on the primacy of force, the legitim legitimacy of conquest, exacerbated ethnic ex exclusivity, aggressive religiosity, tribalism, machismo, and a worship of leaders in hierarchic order, although it is disguised as democratic republicanism. We are witnessing the return of wide-scale invasions under new guise. The phenomenon is far more serious today as the invaders have preserved a formidable home base, the countries they have left, the motherlands which they are always solidly behind and ready to defend, and which secretly aspire to do so through force in the future. So this is interesting, you know, these migrants come to Europe and America and they are posing themselves as this sort of neutral entity, or actually, no, sorry, 
a liberal and even leftist entity, but in reality they aren't. This is just a shroud to hide their, uh, basically, will to power over the native European populations. So now he says, this is why I'm speaking in terms of colonization rather than invasion. The modern egalitarian mindset is utterly powerless. Would it not be better then to readopt those archaic values and inspire our very real enemies and which significant differences notwithstanding have remained the same for all peoples before and after the interlude of modernity? So we must adopt, you know, these ways, the basically the ways that our enemies are thinking in order to defeat them because it's a more natural and pragmatic way of winning. And it's pragmatic because it's it appeals to human values which are real and legitimate values that should be accounted for and appealed to. So quoting him again, he says, In this respect, it is essential to prepare for a likely confrontation by doing away with the modern altruism of universal harmony. It is a matter of rethinking war, not in its modern form as war between nations, but as it existed in antiquity and the Middle Ages, as a clash between vast ethnic or ethno-religious blocks. It would be interesting to reconsider in the new forms in the making, the kind of macro-solidarity once embodied by the Roman Empire and European Christendom. And to pragmatically define the idea of Euro-Siberia as a block extending from Brest to the Bering Strait, from the Atlantic Ocean to the Pacific, across 14 time zones, a land where the sun never sets, and thus the largest geopolitical unit on Earth. Russian leaders are already thinking about this in, in uncertain terms and through the fumes of vodka, but still, they are thinking about it. It would be worth asking ourselves whether French nationalism, he's French by the way, this is why he's bringing this up, may not be completely outdated. Whether the nation state in Europe may not be as anachronistic as Morris monarchist movement that was in the 1920s, and whether the grouping and the tentative construction of a federal European state, for all its short term inconveniences in the long run, may not prove the only means as revised adaptation of the Roman and Germanic imperial model of preserving the brothers' peoples of our great continent from oblivion. It is also worth asking ourselves whether, in this context, the United States still represents an enemy, as I myself once argued, which is to say a posing which is to say a power posing a mortal threat rather than a foe or economic, political, and cultural rival. To raise this question is to identify the neo archaic problem of the global solidarity of the North, which is essentially ethnic in nature, against the threat of the South. In any case, the notion of the West is disappearing and being replaced by the idea of the northern world or the North. So following on, he speaks on the social disintegration, and I quote, That collapse is looming close, can be seen from the failure of, of educational systems which are no longer able to curb illiteracy and crime in schools, for they are dominated by the illusion of quote-unquote non-authoritarian methods of teaching. This can be seen in the spread of urban crime, which is caused not only by unrestrained immigration, but also by the unrealistic dogma of deter deterring crime through education and by the obliteration of the ancient principle of repression, something far from tyrannical when it is based on law. It can also be seen from the demographic collapse caused both by anti-natalist governmental policies and by the ethnic masochism of the ruling ideology as well as by the exacerbated hedonistic individualism that is triggering a boom in anti-natural practices, divorces made automatic, and which will soon be mere administrative formalities. The ridiculing and obstinate rejection both of fiscal and social of the housewife model, the spread of short-lived and sterile forms of common law marriages, and the glorification of homosexuality and soon of legal gay marriages. That will enable those in such unions to be able to adopt children. For example, which we're seeing, we're, it's getting worse now. This was written a long time ago. Um, his demographic fall caused by antinatalism will lead to economic disaster in Europe by 2010 because of the growing deficit in social budgets caused by the aging of. And I just want to comment here. Yeah, he's basically talking about all these factors are going to lead to more degradation crime in schools, uh, the ethnic problem, and social instability because of, you know, a lack of uh, family structure and communal order. Anyways, he says, uh, now he says, it is likely that the post-catastrophic world will have to reorganize social fabrics according to archaic principles, which is to say, human ones. But what are these principles? The power of family units, which are invested with authority and have responsibilities towards their offspring. The legal primacy of the principle of punishment over prevention. The subordination of rights to duties, the framing not of recruitment of individuals with communitarian structures, 
the power of social hierarchy newly made visible through solemn social rites, aesthetic magical function, I guess he's saying here. The rehabilitation of the aristocratic principle, which is to say the rewards given to the best and most worthy for courage, service, and skill, in the awareness that a surplus of rights corresponds to a surplus of duties, and that aristocracies should never degenerate into plutocracies and be wary of becoming hereditary. So he's very much a fan of meritocracy here. Uh, and he wants to re reinstantiate these traditional sort of meritocratic values and a proper hierarchy. Is it then a matter of abolishing freedom? Paradoxically, it is emancipating modernity that has destroyed concrete freedoms by proclaiming an abstract freedom. While in Europe it is merely impossible to expel illegal immigrants, the mafias are branching out, criminal gangs enjoy ever greater impunity, and citizens who respect the social pact are increasingly being recorded in police records, monitored, and having their finances checked, sanctioned, and bled by tax authorities. Faced with this failure, would it not be better to restore concrete medieval or ancient institutions such as franchises, local communitarian pacts, and forms of organic solidarity among neighbors? These then are the general principles. They will probably serve as the foundations for the future societies that will emerge from the rubble of modernity. It is now up to the new ideologies of our current of thought to define these principles and concretely implement them. A few concrete questions should already be raised. Now also, he says, the new societies of the future will finally abolish the aberrant egalitarian mechanism we have now, whereby, quote-unquote, everyone aspires to become an officer, or a cadre, or diplomat, even though all evidence suggests that most people do not have the skills to fulfill these roles. This m model engenders widespread frustration, failure, and resentment. The societies that will be vivified by increasingly sophisticated technologies and contrast will ask for a return to the archaic, inegalitarian, and hierarchical norms. And the reason that is is because in order to have a highly technical society, you're going to need to have highly, you know, you're going to need to have a pragmatic means of organization. And the best one to do that is following along the lines of what is natural to human beings. Not saying something being natural is good, but also think of it in terms of health, is what I should say. Whereby a competent and meritocratic minority is rigorously selected to take on leading assignments. Those who will perform subordinate functions in these inegalitarian societies will not feel frustrated, their dignity will not be called into question, for they will accept their own condition as something useful within the organic community. Finally, freed from individualistic hubris of modernity, which implicitly and deceptively states that each person can become a scientist or prince. Another example concerns the treatment of those who commit crimes. The future will force us to rethink the modern and ineffective means of crime prevention and the reintegration of criminals into society by implementing a, a juridical revolution to restore the archaic methods of repression and forced re-education. Here, too, we must change the way we think. To sum up, with the introduction of quote-unquote hyper-technologies, the social models of the future will lead us not towards greater egalitarianism, as the stupid apologists of universal communication believe will happen thanks to the internet, but rather to a return to archaic and hierarchical social models. On the other hand, it is global technological competitiveness and the economic war for the control of markets and scarce resource resources that are pushing us in this direction. Those who will win it will be the peoples with the strongest and best selected quote-unquote elite blocks and the most organically integrated masses. Speaking once again on the synthesis of futurism and archaism, he states, As we have seen, the modern economic paradigm based on the belief in miracles will meet insurmountable physical obstacles. The utopia of development, quote-unquote development, open to 10 billion people is environmentally unsustainable. The foreseeable collapse of the global economy allows us to envision and formulate the hypothesis of a revolutionary model based on self-centered and inegalitarian world economy, which may be imposed on, upon us by historical events, but which it would be wise to foresee and plan for in advance. This hypothesis is based on the three great paradigms. Here is the archaeofuturist scenario. First off, most of humanity would revert to a pre-technological subsistence economy based on agriculture and the crafts, with a neo-medieval dem demographic, demographic structure. The African population, like that of all other poor countries, will be fully involved in this revolution. Communitarian and tribal life would reassert its rights. Social happiness would most probably be greater than it is in jungle countries like Nigeria or mega slums like Kolkata and Mexico City today. 
even in industrialized countries, India, Russia, Brazil, China, Indonesia, Argentina, etc., a significant portion of the population can return to live according to this archaic socioeconomic model. Secondly, a minority percentage of humanity would continue to live according to the techno-scientific economic model based on ongoing innovation by establishing a global exchange network of about a billion people. A considerable advantage of this would be strong uh, reduction in pollution. Besides, it is, difficult, it is difficult to envision any other solution that would ensure the salvation of the global ecosystem, for even in the near future it would be impossible to make any wide-scale use of clean energy sources. Finally, these vast neo-archaic community, uh, sorry, economic blocks would be centered upon a continental or multi-continental plan, with basically no mutual exchange between them. Only the techno-scientific portion of humanity would have access to the global exchange. This two-tier world economy thus combines archaism and futurism. The techno-scientific portion of humanity would have no right to intervene in the affairs of the neo-medieval communities that form the majority that form the majority of the population nor, most importantly, would it in any way be obliged to help them. No doubt, this, I mean, he says quote-unquote help because he doesn't necessarily consider traditional um, means of living to be, you know, constituting of help. No doubt, this presents a monstrous picture to the modern and egalitarian spirit. Yet, in terms of actual collective well-being, which is to say justice, a revolutionary scenario of this sort may prove rather pertinent. On the other hand, freed from the economic burden of areas, quote-unquote, to be developed and, quote-unquote, helped, the minority portion of humanity would live in a techno-scientific economic system, where innovation would take place at a far higher speed than it does now. Here, too, the return to archaism can be seen to foster futurism and vice versa. So, in essence, you know, the world is going to be divided into an archaic world and a futurist one. And, and this distinction between the, the two is going to kind of lead to a symbiotic relationship where the archaic ways of life enrich the futurist ways of life due to the archaic's anti-egalitarianism, which is just natural among human beings. And thus, the futurist uh, advancement can help produce more and more technology, which is an overall good. And now, you know, he, but they're not necessarily going to expand to them. They might just sustain the distinction and keep everybody happy in their own bubble um but they also might you know there is going to be a form of relations between them which we're going to get into later archaic futurism would enable us to do away with this the scrooge of egalitarian modernism which is already compatible with the century of iron that awaits us the weak spirit of humanitarianism a sham ethic which raises human dignity to the rank of a ridiculous dogma. And he puts human dignity in quotes once again. This is not to mention the hypocrisy of the many well-meaning souls who yesterday forgot to denounce communist crimes and today have nothing to say about the embargo on Iraq and Cuba by the American superpower, Indian nuclear test, the oppression of the Palestinians, etc. The spirit serves as a means of moral disarmament, for it establishes paralyzing prescriptions, taboos that engender guilt and concretely prevent European public opinion and leaders from facing present threats. Actually, what is promoted and implemented under the guise of moral principles is a leftist policy that aims to destroy the very European substratum of Europe. For instance, the campaign against the legal deportation of Sands Papers, I'm not, I don't know how to pronounce that either, which is to say illegal immigrants, led by the French intelligentsia and show businesses uh, efforts to make the deportation of any immigrant impossible in the name of human rights and the pseudo principles of charity the underlying ideology of true strategic ob of the true strategic objective here uh, according to a neo trotskyist plan he says is the flooding of europe with the surplus population of peoples from the south a, ra uh, a further dilemma the campaigns against the nuclear power industry which are leading to the dismantling of swedish and german plants and the complete abandonment of nuclear power by some of the european states with the exception of france which continues to resist but for how much longer he asks everybody knows that controllable accidents notwithstanding nuclear energy is the least polluting among the energies currently available this operation, too, aims at weakening Europe through the excuse of humanitarianism by depriving it of the leading energy technologies, economic independence, and at the same time of any integrated form of nuclear deterrence. The stimulus behind this manipulation of which the credulous intellectual and artistic bourgeoisie of Europe has been made a victim is a sort of monstrous and irresponsible exaggeration from the maxim, quote-unquote, love thy neighbor like thyself. 
an apology for weakness and a pathological form of emasculation and self-blame. What we are facing here is a subculture of emotionality, a cult of decline that serves to lobotomize European public opinion. The fetism, however, is utterly foreign to archaic ways of thinking. It will be necessary to restore the archaic frame of mind if we are to survive in the future. A certain harshness and resolute frankness, a taste for pride and honor, common sense pragmatism and rejection of all non-selective social organizations, an ethic capable of legitimizing, uh, if necessary, the use of strength and that will not back down out of dogmatic humanitarianism when faced with the challenges of technological science and inclusion of warrior virtues and the principle of urgency and inevitable confrontation, a notion of justice whereby it is duties that legitimize rights rather than vice versa natural acceptance of an inegalitarian and pluralist organization of the world also on an ideal uh, also on an economic level sorry an aspiration towards collective power and finally the communitarian ideal those of the of the virtues of the archaic outlook or these are some of the virtues of the archaic outlook he says uh, they will be essential in the world of tomorrow which will be marked by bitter confrontations, a neo-archaic mindset which is in no way barbaric, as it includes the pre-humanitarian and inegalitarian principles of justice, will be the only one compatible with the character of the approaching century. Archaeofuturism and the question of meaning, what religion? One of the few obvious things about our age, which both traditionalists and modernists agree about, is that Western civilization has despiritualized life, destroying all transcendental values. And um, the failed attempts at established secular religions, the empty disenchantment created by a civilization that bases its ultimate legit legitimacy on the value of exchange and the cult of money and the self-destruction of Christianity, have engendered a situation that cannot endure. Malraux was right. The 21st century will, will witness a return to spirituality and religion. Fine, but in what form? Already Islam is making inroads through the breach, offering to fill the spiritual void of Europe. Yet this hypothesis, which we, which may well become reality, is dangerous. Because of its extreme dogmatism, Islam would risk destroying the creativity and inventiveness of the European soul. It's Faustian free spirit. On the other hand, the Machiavellian plans of certain American strategists has led them to encourage the penetration and entrenchment of Islam in Europe in such a way as to induce paralysis. So that is an overall idea of the uh, archaeo futurist future, for lack of a better way of saying that. Uh, now we're going to move on to this next concept here uh, for a two tier world economy, which we kind of just got a taste of before. But for, I'm just going to quote him more at length here. So, quote unquote, progress is clearly a dying idea. Even if economic growth may be continuing, yet no one really, no one is really deriving the right conclusions from this. People no longer believe that tomorrow will be better than it is today, just as today is better than yesterday, thanks to technological and scientific advancements and the alleged educational and moral improvement of humanity. The dogma promoted by Auguste Comte and the French positivists, as well as the spread of democracy. Evidence is mounting that quote-unquote growth, this measurable mockery, does not actually lead to any objective increase in well-being. The decline of the secular eschatology inherited from Christian messianism is a hard blow to the egalitarian worldview, for it erodes the very philosophy of history on which the latter is based. An intellectual revolution is taking place. People are starting to perceive, without daring to openly state it, that the old paradigm according to which the life of humanity on both an individual and collective level is getting better and better every day thanks to science. The spread of democracy and egalitarian emancipation is quite simply false. This age has come to an end. This illusion is dead and gone. The advancement, which some such as Ivan Ilyich had already questioned, lasted just over a century. Today, the perverse effects of mass technology are starting to make themselves felt uh, new resistant viruses. The contamination of industrially produced food, shortage of land, and downturn in world agricultural production, rapid and widespread environmental degradation, the development of weapons of mass destruction in addition to the atomic bomb, etc. Not to mention the fact that technology is entering its Baroque age. All great essential inventions had already been made in the late 1950s. Later enhancements constitute not so much concrete improvements as additional refinements of little use, like decorative touches added to a monument, as an analogy. 
the effect of the internet will be less revolutionary than the telegraph or phone, for it only enhances a pre-existing universal communication system. Technological science conforms to the 80-20 law of energy. Initially, it takes 20 units of energy to produce 80 units of power, but then it takes 80 units of energy to produce only 20 units of power. A possible objection that might be raised is, are we not pessimistically exaggerating the negative consequences of global progress and growth? The answer to this is no. By contrast to the widely echoed suggestions made by French intellectuals, in intellectual uh, Jacques Attali, humanity as a whole has nothing to gain from these things, like the economic boom in Asia. For the price of older industrial countries would have to play in terms of an increase in competition would be huge. In any case, this growth will not continue for long. It is becoming difficult to manage. It will have an environmental impact and cause massive socio-political as well as strategic problems. Catastrophe itself, not the will of governments, will bring change to the current economic system. The few positive effects global economic growth bring are actually transient and fragile, which is to say, you know, they don't last too long, and laden with monumentous consequences. So, yeah, basically the costs outweigh the benefits here. In the global spread of technological science, each step forward implies one step back. So life expectancy is on the increase, although it is stagnating, if not falling in many countries. But does this mean people are living in greater harmony with any less anxieties? It, more and more methods of mass destruction, such as nuclear, bac bacteriological, and genetic bombs are being developed. Agriculture is improving, but ultimately the return of famines is threatening an overcrowded humanity, which infiltrated thanks to the fall in morality. We must now face problems such as soil erosion, the destruction of the tropical rainforest, the decrease in arable land, and the erosion, the destruction of Oh, sorry, I repeated that. And the depletion of fishing resources. It will take 20 or 30 years for the pernicious effects of growth to manifest themselves. But after a deceptive phase in which the living standards appear to be improving, and which is now coming to an end, they will certainly hit hard. The increase in production and the trade leads to new forms of cooperation, but also multi multiplies the causes of conflict and expressions of nationalistic chauvinism, and everywhere feeds the counterfire of religious fanaticism. Communication is branching out across the world, while solitude plagues individuals and a sense of despair takes hold in communities. The urban and technological way of life is shared by 70% of humanity, but what it means, particularly in the South, is life in hellish cities, real cesspools of violence and human chaos. So he's really critiquing here this notion that the advancement of technology necessarily leads to more, um, basically leads to a thriving society all the time. It doesn't. Because technology might be only fit for a certain type of society, which you would argue, which is European society. Few know that the proportionality more people are living in misery and poverty now than before during the Industrial Revolution. Healthcare has improved, but this has led to a demographic uh, explosion and made the new viral diseases spread by immigration more resistant. The global level of energy con consumption is rising, while environmental degradation is worsening, and the threat of environmental collapse mounting. African and Brazilian farmers now have machines to clear the land, but they are destroying their forests, thus paving the way for desertification and future famine. In other words, after a latency period, progress, growth, and the unchecked spread of technological science are producing effects opposite to those desired, engendering a world that is much harsher than the one they wish to transform and improve. Now, now he's going to speak about the failure of global economy, he says, Quote, a serious objection must be now well, must now be addressed that we cannot possibly prevent poor or developing countries from pursuing industrialization, striving to attain wealth by all available means and following in the footsteps of the West and of the global religion of GDP growth. For what an injustice this would be. Make no mistake, historical dreams and hopes are not based on morals but on physical limits. It is the logic of catastrophe that will limit the ambitions of southern countries to develop. These countries, and particularly those in Asia, have yet to become disenchanted with progress. Behind the West in this respect, they still have a positivist approach and are attached to the egalitarian universalism they have just discovered. They wish to imitate the North and, and have their share of the pie. But alas, it is all too late. The Asian financial crisis was a sign of what is to come. The planet end 
hence humanity would never be able to cope if all of Asia and Africa were to attain the same level of techno-industrial development as northern countries. To believe this is possible is to exhibit the kind of faith in miracles typical of universalism. The mass industrialization of emerging countries is most likely physically impossible because of the depletion of resources and the destruction of ecosystems. The prophecies made by the Club of Rome and will no doubt prove to be correct some 50 years too late. Already in the 1960s, some Africans such as Credo Mutua in South Africa argued that pre-colonial tribal societies, small, scattered, and demographically stable societies were far more pleasant than contemporary African societies, which are complete failures based on the botched imitation and poor grafting of the European model, one totally alien to them. So this is what I'm saying before. Is, yeah, basically, you know, he critiques the Western notion of of wealth and prosperity he says well this is only prosperity in the context of us for our people our mindset africans other peoples of different places of the world might be better off living more primitively that might be better for them and you i mean you can see videos of these african tribes you know they're they're dancing around like they're billionaires meanwhile all they have is you know a couple dead buffalo or whatever gazelles and you know, they don't even have, they hardly have clothes, but nonetheless, they're still happier than most people even are in the West. Um, but continuing on here, after all, why should everyone want to reach Mars, travel on 500 kilometer per hour bullet trains, fly in supersonic jets, live to the age of 100 through transplants and antibiotics, chat online, watch TV dramas, etc. This fever only belongs to certain peoples and groups and cannot be extended to humanity as a whole. Should radical people, should radical structures change even in Europe and the United States? Most of the population would no longer be able to share the techno-industrial way of life. But here another objection must be addressed, only raised by technocrats, that it is possible to control the perverse effects of technology, that we can fight pollution and find new resources if there is a common agreement and willingness to do so. This is all very optimistic, but it's only empty talk. It will never happen. The system displays an overall consistent logic and will not transform itself. It is literally incorrigible and must be changed. On the other hand, a new system will affirm itself and will do so in this chaos. We must take a concrete approach and stop having daydreams based on the intellectual masturbations of sham experts. None of the resolutions made by the summits of Rio and Tokyo, however insufficient in themselves, have been respected. Nature, which have sought to dominate and control in all of its molecular and viral forms in the earth itself is now reacting to a violent backlash after a quiet period. Collective certainties are giving way to doubts and distress. A new sort of nihilism is emerging, a highly dangerous because a highly dangerous and desperate one, which has nothing to do with the philosophies of decline and the reactionary prophets of decadence who merely represented the other side of the dogma of progress. Attachment to the past, that is. It is now philosophies of catastrophe that will take the very stage. We are faced by uncertainty, which is casting its disturbance shadow over the very signs of technology that we consider predictable and governable. So now he's going to move on. He's going to talk about the two types of civilization which we will be seeing in this post-catastrophic world. And this is titled, Towards a Fracture of Civilization. What new ideologies or forms of social, political, or economic organization could replace the pursuit of progress and individualism? Are we to return to theocracy, as may, many Islamic countries would like to suggest? The first thing to note is that non-progressive ideologies that reject egalitar egalitarianism are not necessarily unjust, cynical, or tyrannical. It is the egalitarianists who, conscious of the failure of their plans for justice, humanitarianism, etc., wish to portray their enemies in a diabolical light. New inegalitarian worldviews must prove concretely anthropo anthropo sorry, anthropologic rather than ideally humanitarian like egalitarianism this and other and, and the ends of progressive progressivism clearly also coincides with that of hegelian rationalist idealism in order that irrational anti-scientific and anti-industrial ideologies are already spontaneously spreading across the world something which has worried the signatories of the heidelberg appeal we should, however, resist the temptation to believe that industrial cultures will disappear and be replaced by cultures based on magic. Technological, uh, technological science um, will continue to exist and develop while acquiring a new meaning and ceasing to be informed by the same ideal. 
global economic growth will soon clash with physical barriers. It is physically impossible to fulfill the ideal of progressivism, the spread of techno-scientific consumer culture, culture to 10 million people, which, when this dream has faded, another will emerge, according to a scenario I would cautiously envision, one at any rate far less unrealistic than endless and widespread economic growth in the context of either a world state governed by the United Nations or a fragmented planet. The following three elements will coexist. Globalization, the end of statism, and the collapse of civilization worldwide. By statism, he means particular statism. Um, I should make that clear. Something which will be passively endured rather than consciously chosen. This is just going to be like a natural transformation. People preserving a techno-scientific and industrial way of life, yet driven by values other than those we have today, will coexist with people who have referred to traditional societies possibly based on magic, irrational, religious, pastoral, or neo-archaic ones with low levels of energy use uh, and pollution and consumption. He also refused the notion that traditional economies are uh, underdeveloped as well. Progressive thinkers will retort that what I have just suggested implies organizing a sort of revolutionary underdevelopment with gifted people consuming available resources above and ungifted people vegetating below. This idea of underdevelopment is both stupid and unjust. It was invented by progressivism in order to argue that the industrial way of life is the only tru truly human and permissible one. Traditional rural societies not based on technology are not at all barbarous and quote-unquote underdeveloped, according to an inegalitarian and organic worldview. Many development axes exist, not just one. True underdevelopment, or more correctly, true barbarism, is caused by progressivism. Consider all the causalities of the industrial way of life, who for a mirage have abandoned traditional societies with low demographic rates to join the overcrowded megalobuses of southern countries, real urban hells. Besides, the members of traditional societies where little money circulates are neither poorer nor less happy than New Yorkers or Parisians. With all their modern conveniences, even if they may not have health care, that is, that is as good as having lower life expectancies. It should also be noted that the socio-economic fracture which is likely to take place in the 21st century will not be the product of any intentional planning, but rather something imposed on humanity by catastrophe and the chaotic collapse of the present system. But how can different types of society be made to coexist? Won't those below wish to imitate those above and develop? Not necessarily, because on the one hand, the failed attempt to globally extend industrial society and technological science will be remembered as a dark age, as communism is today. Because on the, because on the other, uh, these neo-traditional communities will be pervaded by strong, irrational, or religious ideologies sanctioning their modes of life. Those who will preserve the techno-scientific way of life will be perfectly capable of living within a global economic system, albeit one that is vast in terms of production and trade as the one we have today, and hence less polluting, for it will only concern a minority of people. This minority will be driven not by the eschatology of progress, but rather by necessity born of will. So basically, uh, the reason these this technological society is not going to force itself to expand is because it's not going to be driven by this aberrated progressive will that forces power expansion. According to him, there's going to be a new mentality collectively, which is not going to allow for that. So we're going to talk more about this here. He says, after the inevitable catastrophe that will mark the opening of the 21st century, once the stupid celebrations for the year 2000 are over, it will be necessary to pragmatically plan a new world economy. With a spirit free from all utopias and impossible ideals, and from all will to oppress or colonize a part of humanity that will revert it to neo-traditional societies. The prevailing historical outlook will no longer be progressive idealism, but one based on a realistic, concrete, adaptable, and unpredictable view of reality, nature, and man. Voluntarism, the ideology of concreteness, and the possible is opposed to the idealism of contemporary global civilization, which is based on the abstraction of unachievable goals. Techno-scientific and neo-archaic eras will share an inegalitarian and naturalist worldview, one informed by rationality in the case of the former and by irrationality in the case of the latter. Clearly, many of will fear that death of the ideal of progress and the new order of the world will bring an end to rationality and destroy both science and industrial production, thus setting back the whole of humanity. It is a common misconception, however, that technological science naturally rests on progressive and egalitarian foundations. This is not true. The end of progressivism, with its dream of globally extending industrial consumption, does not imply the dismantling of technological science with the condemning of the scientific spirit. 
Technological science has been perverted by the egalitarian universalism of the 19th and 20th centuries, which has sought to extend its influence beyond all reasonable limits. Those who will continue living in a global techno-scientific civilization, albeit one of a limited reach, will be driven by values other than the consumer frenzy, universalism, and widespread hedonism of the ideology of progress and development. This will not be difficult, as the foundations of science and technology are actually inegalitarian, life sciences, for example, poetic and adaptable in an unpredictable manner. True scientists know that advancements can only be made by destroying previous certainties. Rationality for them is a means and not an end in itself. These scientists know that, dis that discoveries never automatically lead to qualitative improvements and that technological experimentation implies the unexpected increased risks, unpredictability, and the opacity of the future. By contrast, in traditional societies, the future is predictable because history is experienced cyclically. Hence, in neo-traditional areas, linear progressivism will, will be replaced by a cyclical view of history. This is why it's not going to become a progressive society outside of the tradition uh, outside of the future society as well well in techno scientific ones it will be replaced by an unpredictable and landscapist view of history the spherical and nietzschean view promoted by loki which was previously referenced in the latter case history will unfold as a landscape like an unpredictable succession of flatlands mountains and forests governed by no apparent rational order the above view of history and destiny brings greater freedom, responsibility, and clarity to those who embrace it, for they will have to rigorously analyze the true nature of reality and the times, free from utopian reveries and conscience of the unpredictability of things. They will have to apply their will to the implementation of their project, the ordering of human society in such a way as for it to conform to justice as much as possible, acknowledging a man for what he truly is rather than what he would like him to be. So now, yeah, you get, you get more of this idea of time here. Um, now here we're going to move on just a moment. Okay. So he now speaks on the neo-global economy of the new age, but this is not to be confused with the universalist one, as universalism presupposes, you know, this kind of egalitarian ethics. Um, whereas global economy, merely in this case, is a technical term for organization. Another question must now be addressed. Based on the premise of that the two-tier world economy of the future will be a quote-unquote globalized one. How are we to define the notion of globalization with respect to universalism? Can these notions truly be opposed to one another? Well, yes. Universalism is a childish concept based on the illusion of cosmopolitanism. Globalism is instead a practical idea. Global information and exchange networks, networks exist, but do not concern humanity as a whole. Universalization is the ambition to mechanically and quantitatively extend one's way of life in industrial consumption and urban living, to all of humanity. Universality is perfectly compatible with statism, and egalitarianism is its driving force. Billions of human atoms are here asked to live accordingly to the same rule, the one imposed by the reign of, of the market. Globalization, is, in contrast, refers to a process of the spread of markets and companies across the world, and of the internationalization of the economic decisions taken by some central actors, without the need for universalism. Globalization is, in fact, perfectly compatible with the idea that billions of men everywhere may revert to traditional ways of life. On the other hand, and, in this, and this is a crucial point, he says, globalization is equally compatible with the construction of semi-autarkic blocks, autocracy for wide areas, and in a continental scale based on different economic systems. After the failure of economic progressivism and market universalism, a global economy may well come to light and even reinforce itself, that will have no desire to envelop the whole of humanity and will only concern an international minority. This is a perfectly plausible scenario for the aftermath of the catastrophe for technological science and the industrial market. Economy cannot be abandoned, as they are too rooted and already in the process of becoming global. But the idea of universally extending industrial society to all individual humans will have to be ditched, for it is unsustainable in terms of energy, health, and the environment. Now, it's also crucial here to remember we live on a planet with limited resources. This is why it's unsustainable. The neo-global economy in the aftermath of the cat catastrophe will certainly be global in its networks, but not universal. The intrinsic inequality of this new s economic system will help bring environmental destruction to a halt and restore what has been destroyed, thanks to its low level of energy consumption and improve the quality of life of all peoples. Make no mistake, the GDP of the world economy will fall considerably like a 
deflating balloon. One may object that this fall in the global GDP will dry up existing financial resources and make certain investments impossible because of the loss of scale that will have occurred, as the industrial economy will only concern a fraction of humanity, markets, and demands will undergo a sizable contraction. To reason along these lines, however, is to forget that the new economic system will have freed itself from two considerable burdens. Firstly, the substantial cutting down of pollution levels will reduce the huge number of external diseconomies, with all their costs and the burden of having to lend money to developing countries will also be removed, as the goal of developing these countries will have been abandoned altogether. Secondly, the ex the expenses related to the state welfare will drop as most of the mass massive social investments that are currently being made will disappear, as, as they will have become superfluous given the return to a neo-medieval economic model based on solidarity and proximity. Clearly, another solution might be envisage, envisaged, uh, keeping universalism and persuading rich countries to lower their standards of living and the cons energy consumption levels in such a way as to preserve the environment, share wealth with the poor, and balance the industrialization of emerging countries. According to this shrewd and logical perspective embraced by environmentalists, this solution would lie in a more egalitarian rather than less. The above suggestion, however, proves to be an utterly idealistic and rather an inapplicable one. Rationality is never what matters in history. Can we really imagine Americans spontaneously giving up their cars and accepting to pay double the amount of taxes to help the countries of the South? This said, in a snare of the economic fracturing of the planet, wide areas and, and sections of the population within the industrial countries of the North could perfectly well refer to traditional forms of economy with low levels of energy consumption and subsistence farming. And now we're going to look at some more comments here uh, on the inegalitarian nature of the New World. He states, uh, what it is important to grasp is the fact that technological science has had devastating effects because it has driven by the egalitarian ideology of universal progressivism, not because of any intrinsic shortcomings. As right-wing traditionalists and dogmatic environmentalists believe, the techno-industrial model is now collapsing under the weight of disenchantment because it has been extended beyond all reasonable limits and has been fancifully credited credited with the miraculous ability to bestow a whole range of blessings. So basically that there's being a misattribution to progressive ideology because it correlated not necessarily but contingently with te technological innovation. But actually by its very nature, technological science is something that only tends to concern a minority of the human population for it is too energy consuming for it to be greatly extended. Clearly do-gooders will accuse the above of promoting widespread exclusion. But this is merely another quasi-religious idea that stems from reductionist ways of thinking and the belief that is that it is more legitimate to extend present developments to everyone. Yeah, maybe not everyone should have these things. Maybe they're not meant for everybody. Actually, the quote-unquote exclusion of neo-traditional communities from the techno-scientific sphere would coincide with the exclusion of the latter from the neo-traditional world. We should do away with the prejudice concerning... Uh, prejudice according to which the techno-scientific societies are more developed than traditional ones. This myth of savage is an implicitly racist one, according to the Fay. According to the scenario that can be envisaged, envisaged on the basis of the aforementioned suggestions, neo-traditional communities would in no way be inferior or underdeveloped. On the contrary, they would conform to the rhythm of a different kind of civilization, one no, one no doubt superior to that of today. This inability to free oneself from the dogmas and paradigms of progressivism and egalitarianism and to envisage uh, different socioeconomic solution, so solutions plagues Western intelligentsia as a whole. So he's saying, I mean, yeah, the we're going to exclude neo-traditional society, but they just as well exclude us. So it's an equal form of exclusion because they, they are going to have that mindset of traditionalism. They don't want anything to do with us. Now... Uh, the ethnic question in the European is the next, and I believe the final section we have here. So we're going to go through basically some more stuff on, on you know, eth ethnicity. The ethnic question along with the environmental will be one of the most serious challenges humanity will have to face in the stormy century of iron and fire that awaits us. It primarily concerns Europe and within Europe, France, which is undergoing mass demographic colonization from other continents, a phenomenon whose magnitude and consequences media and political leaders are seeking to conceal. The, ruler, the ruling ideology is based on one central dogma that the ethnic question does not matter. It is always the same story. In the name of a false love of humanity, scorn is poured upon the crucial concept of folk. Future historians will no doubt study this amazing phenomenon 
which as an alter effect of colonization has been affecting Western Europe and France since the 1960s. In less than three generations, the ethnic substrate of these lands has been radically altered. Surely this should be of interest. Instead, it is only considered a secondary matter by the petty, inglorious princes who pretend to be governing us. We should do well we should do well to read the essay by the black American sociologist Stanley Thompson, published by Boston University Press in 1982, American Communities. The author here attempts to evaluate the contribution made by each ethnic community to American society in terms of its mentality. The conclusion of this rather iconoclastic book is that on account of their managerial wills, honesty in business, and quote-unquote pride, Germanic immigrants contributed far more than the English, Scottish, Welsh, Irish, or any immigrant group to strengthen the American Imperial Republic. The author ratherly rather sternly notes that in growing increasingly Hispanic, or more precisely Mexican, the United States will change its ethnocultural foundations in a long term possibly enter a phase of decline, in terms of objective power at least in comparison to India and China. The reading offered by this Afro-American and Germanophile intellectual is no doubt an incomplete and exaggerated one, yet it also contains much common sense for Thompson realized that the basis of a civilization and the destiny of a given culture are not sheer mechanical facts depending on economic organization alone, but rather on things that have human and organic roots, which is to say cultural and ethnic roots. Yeah, because ec economic organization is done by human beings, which are something organic and ethnic. Um, continue on here. Shlomo Schwam, who was a chair of philosophy at the University of Ramat Aviv in Israel in the 1980s, shared the following confidential remark with me during one of the Athens symposiums. And this is, he says, quote, the economic and military power of Israel and its safety in the face of Arab countries rests on its sabras. An Ashkenazi or other words, Ashkenazi immigrants from Europe, the primary foundation of history in anthropology, which determines cultural behavior. The plan for bringing, this is the next part, the plan for bringing ethnic chaos to Europe. The ethnic question today is taboo and hence crucial. After a long period of migratory stability, Europe and France in particular is now experiencing mass immigration from Africa and Asia, which is changing the ethnic composition of our land against the will of its native population and in contempt of the democratic democratic traditions we have inherited from the Greek cities of the Roman Republic and Germanic law. Immigrationists reason that France has always been a land of melting pots and large-scale innovations. Proof of this, the endless waves of Celts, Germanics, Romans, and Slavs have entered the country, sure, but these were neighboring peoples, close cousins to be more precise. France is indeed a mix of almost all ethnic components of our continent, including the Germanic, but these were all populations with mental structures and forms of behavior close to our own. For the notion of ethnic proximity, while necessarily bioanthropological in nature, primarily concerns people's proximity in terms of worldview and instinctual attitudes. King Clovis's Koenig, or King Clovis's to call him by his name, was assigned the role of Roman consul by Constantinople. Mental continuity thus extended in the land of the Gauls between the Roman and Germanic worldviews, which were added to the existing substratum of the related Celtic peoples. It is well known that, from an ethnic point of view, France is a synthesis of European peoples. Immigrationists justify the massive flux of immigrants from Africa and Asia by arguing that France that has always been a land of quote-unquote miscegenation. But this is misunderstood because France has always been a land of a mix of European peoples which share genetic lines. And hence nothing has changed and that we're merely continuing our tradition, and that there is nothing to worry about. Actually, the miscegenation in question only occurred between European peoples. The Germanic invaders, the most commonly invoked culprits, were not quite as invading as, the one, as one is led to believe. For after all, they were probably already present in the land of the Gauls prior to their alleged invasion, sharing a culture that is very similar to that of the pre-Gallo-Romans, uh, or of the Gallo-Romans, rather. The real invasions are not those that occurred in late antiquity, but those we are experiencing today. Here's another sophism used by the immigrationists. He says, The idea that the percentage of foreigners in the French population today appear to be as much as that in the year 1930. To believe this is to ignore the mass naturalization of immigrants that has occurred, and most importantly, the fact that thanks to the aberrant law of ground, millions of young people of Afro-Asiatic origin do not see who do not see themselves as being French at all are indeed regarded as such by law. By Asian, he probably also means like Arabic and Middle Eastern. These people reason in ethnic terms, unlike Parisian intellectuals. The mixing that took place in the land of the Gauls, whatever its scale, 
only occurred among peoples who were cousin folks from the point of view of anthropology and culture as well as linguistics. By contrast, the Afro-Asiatic populations which have moved to our continent since the 1960s, altering its ethnic and cultural composition. The Muslims in France will soon reach 5 million from around 2005. Islam will be the most practiced religion in the country, which I think it is today. Share no anthropological, cultural, or even mental proximity to European natives. Unlike the Germanic populations with respect to the Romans, Celts, or Slavs, what we are witnessing then is the is a break from tradition, not any form of traditional continuity. On the other hand, the Germanic invasions of late antiquity, like all the other military incursions or flows of immigration from France experienced in 1,000 years of its history at the hands of Moors, English, Dutch, Spanish, Germans, Russians, and Italians, never caused any radical ethnic changes or cultural dichotomies. Hence, the partisans of immigration compare these intra-European movements to the mass demographic colonization to which we are being subjected to today. They are quite wrong. Theirs is merely an intellectual absurdity used to conceal the true nature of what is happening. With their twisted and ultimately anti-democratic reasoning, these people aim to favor the spread of ethnic chaos in Europe while concealing its reality. Let us not forget that the immigrationist lobbies are headed by Trotskyists, whose irrational and hidden feeling has always been hate for European ethnocultural identity. Besides, and I mean, if you look into it, you'll know why that is. Besides, these internationalists are supported in their plans by ultra-liberalism of American inspiration. The geopolitical goal of the United States, and we can't really blame them for playing their cards, says Faye, is to dominate the continent of Europe, destroy its ethnocultural identity, and take over its markets and techno-economic resources. No doubt France had already experienced a series of immigration fluxes in the early 20th century at the hands of Spaniards, Italians, Portuguese, Poles, etc. But again, these were all people from areas not far away, Catholic folk who spoke related languages and even had a sort of shared historical memory. Henry III was king of Poland, and all of European history is but an assemblage of transcontinental fragments of memory. French history cannot be understood without constant references to Germany, Italy, Russia, England, Spain, etc. These intra-European migrations, which in any case took place on a far more limited scale than contemporary migrations from Africa and Asia, may be compared to migrations from North Africa or from a continental China uh, to the country's maritime areas. A degree of mental distance is certainly exists between contemporary Flemings and Germans. On the one hand, the Greeks are Sardinians, and on the other, but it is considerably less than that which separates us from the ethnic blocks of other continents. Can people simply be mixed together as a cook would mix his vegetables to make a salad? We should not hesitate to speak up against the crypto-racist ideology of the partisans of unchecked mass immigration, immigrationist lobbies of Trotskyist observance, and perfectly aware of the fact that multiracial society means multiracist society, something that has already been noted many times in the present work, which is worth stressing again and again. So now we're going to read here uh, another section, and this section basically is titled uh, The Frauds of Globalization and Cosmopolitanism. How tomorrow will be an ethnic world. Is worrying about ethnic questions not pointless in the age of globalization, asked Faye? Not at all. It is futuristic. For we are not moving towards the disappearance of the notion of folk, but towards its strengthening. Both the partisans and the enemies of globalization are t uh, tilting at windmills. Through international trade and exchanges, globalization had already occurred between the 16th and 20th centuries, and it is now an established fact um, it was set in motion by Europe and its great discoveries, the conquest of America and colonization. Still, the globalization of commerce has never been synonymous with ethnic intermingling or with unchecked free trade. We are experiencing globalization today. This simply means instant communication and the establishment of transnational communications, as well as strategic economic, scientific, and financial networks. Still, first, globalization does not prevent the United States from basing only 12.4% of its economy on extracontinental trade. Second, globalization does not prevent France, Italy, or Germany from keeping the vast majority of its exports within Europe. And third, globalization only affects a small percentage of human activities. What we should be critical of, from our point of view, is rather the champions of globalization, or more precisely, cosmopolitanism. This term serves not a not as a means to describe an existing reality, but as a weapon of ideological warfare against Europe, destined to anthropologically flood our continent after having paralyzed it politically. These champions of cosmopolitanism say, the people of the earth are one, so let us intermix. 
They would like us to believe that the future of the planet consists in widespread intermixing, and that political and economic frontiers are being eroded. But theirs are only sophism, sophisms. This is not at all what is happening. Ethnic homogeneity through miscegenation is not, is not at all waiting around the bend. On the contrary, ethnic blocks are growing stronger. Only Europe and North America are being subjected to immigration. Only Europe and North America, or rather their intelligentsias, believe and make others believe in the inevitability of, global, of a global melting pot. Just as Marxism made people believe in the scientific inevitability of the rise of internationalist socialism, globalization represents a central component of the cosmopolitan ideology, which is so wisely explaining how we are historically forced to accept the mass influx of Afro-Asiatic immigrants and to relinquish our ancient anthropological and ethnic identity as Europeans. Now, globalization and immigration do not concern the rest of the world. It is an intellectual deception to argue that globalization is a worldwide phenomenon, reflecting the course of history. What is real, by contrast, is the mass demographic colonization we are experiencing we are being subjected to. China, India, Africa, and Arab Muslim countries are no longer intermixing. They are exporting their blood while preserving themselves as closed blocks. They are conquering us, partly as a form of revenge, as previously argued, through a method of infiltration which is far more effective than open military invasion, for it won't trigger any immediate reaction in revolt. This is There's a good video by Al the Alternative Hypothesis called Mass Immigration as a Form of Warfare. This is exactly what he's describing here. Still, a concrete medium-term risk exists of ethnic civil war in Europe. Should be a later, later, uh, later rediscover its identity and lost homogeneity. This would take the form of civil revolt on the part of native Europeans, which might be triggered by the aforementioned convergence of catastrophes. The dumb pacifism of the immigrationists and their dreams of harmonious intermingling will lead straight to war. But so much better, stupid ideas are always overthrown by hard facts. So now we're over here. We're kind of wrapping up almost. We're at our, uh, I believe this is our last, yeah, this is our last section titled For a Democratic and Federal European Nationalism. We must abandon French nationalism along with the shady Europeanism of the Brussels Commission and play with the card of the third way, European nationalism in the framework of EU institutions. We must do so with intelligence and by avoiding manifest extremism. How can it be normal for those who have always dreamt of a great Europe to balk at boarding the plane when it is about to take off? Even if we don't even if the, even if they don't like the pilots, shouldn't they have the courage to play the pirate to play the pirates of the air? I would now like to examine a number of crucial points concerning the way we should shape this nationalist view of a future, United States of Europe. Clearly these only outlines and these are only outlines and suggestions. History shows that all revolutionary thought must be based on a set program, as Caesar, Napoleon, and Lenin knew well, until a collective shock occurs, uh, sorry, um, that through the wavering and sinking of people's spirits will enable its implementation. The making of affirmation of a new historical entities depends upon the meeting of these two notions, which serve as the sperm and egg of history. We must embrace a genuinely democratic and no longer bureaucratic European government with a real parliament and a strong and decisive central power. We must do away with the national dimension which is no longer viable. It is ridiculous, for instance, for the presidency of the EU to be assigned to Luxembourg after Germany, particularly now that the plans have been made to extend the EU to central Europe. We must then establish autonomous regions, or Lander, according to an extended German model, where general agreement will determine the political will of each federal power, and the president of the Union will be directly elected. Regional autonomy would reinforce the ethnic character of the Union, which is currently overshadowed in France by the ideology of the state. Ethno-regional identity is already gaining increasing importance across Europe. This is a weighty historical tendency, to use Ferdinand Bartel's expression. This form of regionalization must be promoted, not in a vaguely romantic way, but by illustrating its technical institutional advantages. A union composed of 15 different states of a variable sizes would not be easy to govern. It would be better off to have 70 launder, uh, each protecting its own autonomy and democratically representing the local population, and a debureaucratized, it's kind of like you're talking about a republic here, central government. With Brussels as the capital and the Federalist District of the Union, that would be something more than the present Rump Parliament in Strasbourg. The United States of Europe, an organic assembly of the large and highly autonomous regions, some which would consist of present states such as the Czech Republic and Ireland, would determine a new world geopolitics and accelerate the course of history. Only in this framework could it be possible for Europe to complete the 
with the dollar emancipate itself from NATO and negotiate with the United States on equal footing. Considering human cowardliness, I believe that this order, structural revolution, secretly planned since the end of the European civil wars and the difficult birth of a new internationally influential historic entity will profoundly change the outlook of the contemporary French people who are currently victims of the whims of the Parisian state. We must trust history, which is synonymous with movement, change, and assault. At the same time, it is necessary to envision a radical development of the Schengen area, a free inner circulation, and consider adopting a fortress logic for the Union. The future regions must be granted large powers with respect to international matter, or sorry, internal matters, cultural, linguistic, educational, etc. As a return to regional identity on a European level would only contribute uh, to our common strength. Different but united. For united we stand, divided we fall. For an economic point of view, we must consider the prospect of establishing a semi-autarkic common European space. Global free trade is not viable. The United Europe of the future must determine the, the GATT agreement and adopt a moderate and but effective form of con, uh, continental protectivism. Uh, protectionation, uh, in other words. Um, protectionism, sorry, what am I saying? Uh, we are numerous enough not to have any vital need for foreign trade, which we which often also implies dangerous transfers of technology in the long in the long term. We must think in Euro strategic terms. Gorbachev had understood this well. Ours is a common home, he noted, from Brittany to uh, to Komshka, uh, twenty five thousand kilometers lie between the shores of Groy and those of Karyansk, um, but the men are the same. The virtual citizens of a human of a common empire are ultimately members of the same folk the european which can accommodate guests but not invaders gorbachev simply wished to express this intuition that we are part of the same group of peoples that we should stop waging war against each other as in the yugoslav wars the last foolish european war and unite our linguistic differences are only details compared to our ethnographic commonalities. This is the Germanic approach to history, as the ethnic logic asserting itself against the utopia created by the French Revolution, which has nothing particularly democratic about it, in the Greek sense of the word, but on the contrary, it is strikingly totalitarian. We should do well to join Russia one day and envisage, and envisage uh, the future of, in terms of Euro-Siberia. The unpleasant conditions of Russia finds itself in today are only a transient and short-term problem. All we must do is counter the natural and understandable will of the United States to control Euro-Siberia and lend Russia's protection and financial assistance in view of its future strategic and economic reduction to subservience. Euro-Siberia, now he's going to talk more about this idea, Celts, Germans, Greeks, Slavs, Scandinavians, Romans, Iberians, or rather we, the descendants of these people, must now see ourselves as part of the same folk, in the inheritors of a common land, a vast motherland with colossal resources, both material and human, shaped by a common history. According to the less ambitious hypothesis, this land would stretch from the Atlantic to the Russian borders. According to the most ambitious one, which must always be promoted, it would be identified with Euro-Siberia, which which may also be taken as a paradigm for the for the idea of greater Europe, a land stretching from Brest to the Bering Strait, 24 times the size of France. This would be the, the largest unified political entity in the history of mankind, one extending across 14 time zones. Politics is only for those capable of having a broad, very broad view of things, as Nietzsche said. One of our frontiers would be the Amur River, our border with China. Others would be the Atlantic and Pacific, our borders with the Imperial American Republic, the leading world superpower, but one geostrategic and cultural decline has already been virally programmed for the first quarter of the 21st century, as foretold by Zbigniew Brzezinski. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that correctly either. Two other frontiers of ours would be the Mediterranean and the Caucasus. Our borders with the Muslim bloc, which is less divided than is commonly thought. This bloc will give us no quarter and will probably represent our greatest threat. But at the same time, if we are strong enough, it may represent an excellent partner. We, the descendants of related peoples, are being offered the chance to share a space that, already in our children's lifetime, may come to embody that of Charles V. Dreamt about the, dreamt about, dreamt about, but was unable to preserve. But an empire on which the sun never sets. When it is noon in Brest, it is 2 a.m. on the Bering Strait, and vice versa. This is an ideal we can pursue. One of the few remaining ones in this age of pessimism to build an empire of our own. 
What a haunting dream. Great plans are drawn not with pomp and uh, solemnity, but in the silence and cabinets, and they are implemented by predators on their guard for a historical disaster to happen and make their prey emerge from the undergrowth in panic. The folk unconsciousness will always be the hardcore stuff upon which the plans of revolutionary leaders will rest. In human history, the establishment of Euro-Siberian complex would represent a revolution greater than that of the short-lived Soviet Union or even the United States of America. This event of global importance could only be compared with the foundation of the Chinese or Roman empires. Whatever the reasons explicitly given to justify this process and which are of little importance, the European family is coming together in its common home. As in the past, like the Greeks against the Persians, almost 2,400 years ago, we are uniting our cities to face a vague but already perceivable threat. Greater Europe must be peaceful and democratic, yet autonomous, inflexible, and invincible. Clearly, in the technological and economic sphere too, for what it needs to do, for what it needs does an empire have being of imperialistic. So he doesn't want an imperial empire; he just wants a strong, united Europe. An imperial logic will extend to all the peoples of the earth, each folk in its own land, to defend itself from the aggressions of others, effectively managing the destinies of spaceships Earth. The chaotic event we are witnessing, this disorderly group of Europeans, which only awaits to, to be organized, may represent the reconstitution of historical recurrence in a different and larger form. Not only the Holy Roman Empire with its center in the Mediterranean, oh sorry, but also of the Holy Roman Empire with its center in the vast Euro-Siberian plain, which opens onto our four seas. Leviathan and Behemoth rolled into one. A view of tomorrow from the harbor of the breast of the Port of Arthur from our horizon islands in the Arctic to the victorious son of Crete, from the fields of the steppe and from the fjords to the, to the Makwa. I don't know if that's how you pronounce that either. There's a lot of French in this uh, text. A hundred nations free and united, regrouped for, to form an empire, will perhaps be winning for themselves what Tacitus called the kingdom of the earth, Orbis Terrari Ragnum. So that basically is breakdown of Guillaume Fay, his idea, his book, Archaeal Futurism. There's more to read in that book, but I think these are the key points. I hope you enjoyed, and uh, yeah, we'll have more videos on your way.